morning. That's better, isn't it? <laughs> First of all, everyone gets big awards for making it through the chocolate, is it a walk or a run? Anyway, it's a chocolate, it's a snarl right now out there, and uh, kudos to all. I think um, President Hogan and I are going to each talk for about three minutes and then make a conversation. And, uh, it, you know, we've, um, we'll be talking about the future of the humanities, state of the humanities. And um, should I kick it off? Take off. Okay. Um, it's only fair that she starts because, you know, while I'm a humanist, uh, several years ago I went into academic administration. So I left the humanities for the world of the inhumanities. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's going to be much more informed than I am. <laughs> However, if you Google me, you will see me wearing iPods in a very kind of funny picture um, that Duke took because um, I guess my claim to fame, whatever that means, is that um, in 2003, uh, barely after the iPod was introduced, you may remember those billboards of girls against colorful backgrounds with their hair streaming. There was not a single known educational use for an iPod. It was before iTunes U existed. It was before um, video existed. It was before you could do anything but listen to music. Um, Apple came to Duke and said, we would like you to be an Apple digital campus. You can use any one of our technologies and give them to your first year students as an ex educational experiment. And we thought about giving them laptops, and I said, it, I was the R&D person, basically, for the university, and we said, that's kind of boring. Let's go with the technology students love and see what they can do with it. This is going to get to the humanities very soon. Um, <laughs> we only gave them to the first-year students. And within a day, the second, third, and fourth-year students were furious because they said, we paid Duke tuition, too. What are you doing? And we said, oh, my goodness, we've made such a mistake. And I, I'm not going to say we're a Machiavellian. That's the first humanities reference. I'm not going to say we're a Machiavellian, but we immediately said, look, if you come up with an interesting educational use for the iPod, this music listening device that you think is so cool and that you seem to have growing from your ears because the students were everywhere with these iBuds, earbuds, and if you can convince a professor to change a syllabus and include your new educational use for the iPod in a course next semester, we will give you and your professor and every student in the class a free, a free Duke-branded iPod. Well, all heck broke loose. Um, we were on Newsweek. We were on NBC, we were on Chronicle of Higher Education, and when educators are on the cover of Newsweek, it's rarely good news. <laughs> it usually means that we're, you know, um, uh, like Plato, leading the younger generation to the dogs and about to be executed. Um, and we got in a lot of flack for this experiment. However, within one semester, we had given away more iPods to second, third, and fourth year students who had come up with really innovative educational uses for them then we'd given away no strings to those first-year students. Now, what's interesting to me, and I just, this week, we just celebrated the 10th year of the I, and here's some of the uses. Biomedical engineering students figured out how to put the earbud in one ear, a stethoscope in the other ear, put it on someone's chest, and access the National Institute of Health catalog of heart arrhythmias, so a nurse or even a practitioner could hear heart arrhythmias. Podcasting got invented by Duke students who held the first podcasting conference, and I say, put, I'm doing this because when I found the posters, when I was writing my book and went back and found the original posters we'd made, we had to use quotation marks because we didn't know what to call it. Um, how to do video. Um, students figured out a way that they could play a violin, They're like the music students, and put their violin into a quartet of famous violinists and hear how they would sound against the best. They did oral histories and ethnographies. They created um, uh, multimedia art on the iPods. In other words, the range. There was no department where something significant didn't happen. But that was almost unheralded. Um, about two weeks ago was the 10th anniversary of the iPod, and Times Higher Education UK asked me to write a little op-ed about this experiment. And I wrote pretty much what I've just told you. And the um, executive who'd been head of the experiment at Apple wrote and said, you know, you think you got millions and millions of dollars, we, that we at Apple got millions and millions of dollars of free 
R&D from your Duke students, and that's true. He said, but the most important thing we learned is that educational failure and risk-taking and innovation gets written off almost immediately um, by the press, but also by worried parents as, as, as dangerous. This is going to hurt students. Educational success goes almost silent. He said, what we learned from that, and think about this when you think about those brilliant Apple commercials from the last 10 years, he said, what we really learned is to pitch our new devices and our innovations at learning and lifelong learning and exciting interfaces that all the humans can use, but not at formal education. Isn't that sad? To me, that's, and I hope we talk about that. That seems tragic to me that what they really learned at Apple was a great a advertising strategy, and that education is rarely reported on for the good things, the positive things, the innovative things. Um, where I find, have been doing this year, I'm on a book tour, and this I think is about my, I don't know how many, I'm, I'm doing 50 events that basically go from Durham, North Carolina to Bangkok. And um, I'm talking to audiences, and what I find is if I'm gonna talk about innovations, in the humanities, and even more important, in the way for this new digital age that, and we all heard about this with Steve Jobs' recent tragic passing, the way that the humanities and technology are now integrated again in a way they haven't been in a century, right? Steve Jobs kept saying the reason everybody loves Apple products is because we've put the humanities back into technology. We've put the human back into technology. We've made interfaces that are beautiful. He, he's often quoted as saying, the reason I was an innovator of the iPod is because I studied ancient, ancient calligraphy, right? About design and movement and, and the hands touched to the paper, the tactile touch to the paper, and technology's touch to the heart, right? That's a paraphrase of a Steve Jobs quote. But when I talk about innovation and the importance of re-wedding the humanities to the sciences for the digital age, and that STEM is impoverished unless we remember the lesson of calligraphy and that, it has to, that technology has to connect to the mind, the hand, and the heart to really be effective, and to society to really be effective, I always go back and talk about history. So the reason I got into this whole business with iPods is because I'm really a historian of the last information age, which happens around the time of the Founding Fathers, when for the first time in history, because of steam-powered presses, <clears throat> machine-made ink, and machine-made paper, books were cheap. And that meant middle and working-class people became readers for the first time in human history. Freaked out the Founding Fathers, right? You know, here they are presiding over a brand new nation, and instead of the populace, the populace being able to get the message of literacy from a preacher or from a politician, they could read these books. Not only could they read these books, they could write these books. And these books were popular. So one of the things the Founding Fathers did in, in 12 of the original, uh, in the original um, states that, founded the, that signed the Constitution was said that it was that compulsory, mandatory um, public education, not compulsory and mandatory, I take that back, public education should be one of the foundations of democracy. Because if people can read for themselves, they need to learn reading, writing, and basics of arithmetic. In a democracy, you need those things. Virtually everything we know about education today is founded in the 19th century to train citizens for the industrial era. And what I've been talking about for the last um, several weeks now on this tour, and what I'd be delighted to talk about more today, is how we have to now rethink what the three R's are for a digital era. It's not about the future, it's about now. For an era where students not only have literacy, but have a new information age. The, the great historian Robert Darnton says, there have only been four information ages in all human history. All human history. 4,000 BC Mesopotamia with writing, changes the way people communicate and interact. 10th century China and then Renaissance Europe with Gutenberg and movable type changes who has, can actually print a book and can disseminate a book and the ability to print a book. The era I was just talking about, which is the industrial era printing at the time about the, of the American Revolution, after the American Revolution, and now, basically starting in April 1993, when the Mosaic 1.0 browser, invented at the University of Illinois, goes public. And we suddenly, 
the world suddenly has email and, the inter and access, commercial access to the internet for the first time in human history. What that means is I don't need an editor to publish my ideas. I can have an idea, I go home to my computer, I write my idea, and you can have it. What, how do we train, you know, if Thomas Jefferson was worried about training citizens in a world where they had the ability to read, or could have the ability to read, how do we train citizens for a world where they have the ability to think an idea and communicate that idea to anybody in the world, right? I think we need reading, writing, arithmetic, and a fourth R. I think we need algorithms. Algorithms are the procedural uh, building blocks of programming. Doesn't mean we have to train everyone to be a programmer. In fact, I think humanistically, what we have to do is train programmers to think about those things I mentioned before that Stephen Jobs said, how we tie technology to the hand, to the hand, <laughs> the mind and the heart, and to each other, and to society. And I think that if you used, um, there's some fabulous programs like Scratch, which is a nonprofit program made at the Media Lab, which is, teaches programming to little kids, programming as storytelling, because that's what programming is. If I do this, this will happen. It's how you make narrative, and Scratch actually allows little kids to use, to make multimedia narratives, and it works, and you have a building block, and you build on it, and suddenly you can make a whole um, interactive story online. So it's about code and programming, which would be the STEM side of things, but tied directly to storytelling and communication, which is the humanities side of things. But what is important before we can get there as a society and realize that, is everything we've inherited now was not handed down, you know, like the tablets to Moses. It's very recent in human history. Almost everything we know about contemporary education is basically created from 1840 to 19, 1910, that period, and it created for the Industrial Age. And now it's our turn to create, to recreate education, I believe, for a post-Industrial Age. And that also means bringing the two cultures of science, technology, and engineering back together with arts humanities, history, and human connection again. Um, they were separated artificially. If you told Galileo or Newton or da Vinci that there would be this division between those things, they would think that was nonsensical. Really? In a world of technology, you think there's no human element? You think there's no social element? Uh, bringing them back together again means we have to think historically in order to build on that and move to the future. So that's what I would, that's the point of view I'm bringing today, and I hope we have a great conversation um, about that. Wow. <laughs> that's a nice, uh, that's a nice start. So I'm, I'm just going to ask you a question before making any remarks myself. So I don't, I don't see you as one of those people who are depressed about the future of the humanity. Uh, you know, it's become a kind of cottage industry right. these days. Uh, you can kind of hardly open an issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education without reading a forum about the humanities in a state of crisis and the decline of the humanities and the loss of the relevance of the humanities. But when I'm listening to you, I see a vibrant intellectual who sees a future, a big future for the humanities. Am I, am I wrong? Or you're not depressed, obviously. I don't I, think you've ever been depressed, actually. But <laughs> right now, I say you're definitely not depressed. I have an 85-year-old father who makes me look like a depressive. I mean, he's a, I, I, it's one of the best gifts we can ever give our kids, is a positive outlook on the world, which is not a naive outlook. I actually think it's the opposite of a naive outlook. I think you need to stay positive in order to make innovation and make change. You can't be an activist unless you believe you can make a difference in the world. And I'm very grateful to have inherited that from my Chicago-born dad. Um, hi, dad, if you're listening. Um, uh, I was fortunate to begin my career as an academic. I was very young when I got my PhD. I didn't actually like school very much, and I was kind of a, you know, was always getting kicked out of schools and barely made it through, oh, sainted Elmhurst College, excuse me. And um, it was very, very young. And my first job was actually at the Illinois Humanities Festival, at the Illinois Humanities Council, uh, working as a humanist for the scientists at Fermi Lab, who were so depressed trying to run that <laughs> poor unidirectional super. So super depression lab. just isn't limited to right. the humanities. Exactly. <laughs> 
And it was the w until the present, it was the worst job crisis yeah. for um, students. And we were, yeah. everyone was talking about the crisis in the humanities. That was a long time ago. That's I'm when talking I got my 70s. PhD. And, and, yeah. And, and, it was and the there crisis. were no jobs, and we thought the world I was coming to an end. I think we have to end, talk and... about the urgency of the humanities and forget yeah. talking about the crisis language. It hasn't served us for the last 50 years, and it's not going to serve us for the future. And fortunately, a trend, and I'm going to throw this back at, 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 at my colleague here, I noticed for a while you could not find a humanist presiding over any university. Now there's oh, not we're making a, a comeback. Now there's a lot. <laughs> there's a number of very yeah. prominent, including my own president at Duke, who's an English teacher, uh, and and President Hogan too. It's fascinating. So let me ask you, why are humanists becoming presidents of universities? Maybe we're good at dealing with crisis. I don't know. I have no idea, but I I, you know, I think it's it's not a bad sign. It's that's not for a bad sure. sign. And. Uh, but I'm, I'm in, I've been really curious about a debate now that's been going on for, and everyone here knows about it, about the future of the humanities, the state of the humanities, and, and uh, you know, the whole books, whole conferences have been held on this. There's articles and the substantial literature all pretty much saying the same thing, that humanities is in a state of crisis and uh, offering a vigorous defense, which I think we could all mount on behalf of the humanities. But when I got up this morning, and came down here. I mean, it's a beautiful day in Chicago. People had to work to get here, and we got 300 people plus sitting in the room to hear a couple of humanists talk. It's hard to get depressed about that, you know what I mean? And then, I, then I'm reading in the book about the, the Humanities Festival, and I'm realizing that it goes on for like 10 days. There are like uh, 150 different programs, it's going to engage about 50,000 people here in Chicago. It's sponsored by major corporations and foundations, and I'm scratching my head and wondering where the crisis is in humanity. I mean, obviously, we don't get a lot of money. We're not well-funded, but maybe that's just a temporary crisis. Everybody's short of funds these days to do the work they'd want, particularly if they're connected with universities, and especially public universities. But you know, when I look over my life from when I was in graduate school till today, in, in the discipline of history, um, it just exploded with new histories. I mean, I came out of the old history, as they say, political and diplomatic history, but in the wake of that, over the years since, we've just seen an explosion of creativity, new ideas, the, you know, new social history, and then that's the cultural turn women's history, gender history, histories of gays and lesbians, all the unknown and untold histories have now been, are becoming known and are being told. It's a very creative period in historical studies, and the same can be said uh, if you happen to be in an English department these days or in the fine arts. So I don't think we've lost our edge in terms of our creative instincts and our, but look at your own uh, work, for example, completely uh, new and vital direction. Very so, I think the humanists are doing some of their best work, and they're doing it under very, very difficult circumstances. And so I think it's a cause to be upbeat and optimistic about the future rather than, I mean, there are things to worry about, and we can talk about that. I think we may be losing the battle in the classroom, for example, and I'm disturbed by the declining number of students who choose any of the humanities for their majors. And and if you, know, if you don't have students coming in and majoring in the humanities, then the humanities will have a bit of a problem going, going forward. And we ought to think about ways that we bring students back into our classroom and choose history or English or the fine arts as, as, as a major. But other than that, I think uh, you know, we're in pretty good shape. Right. And the numbers are great. You know, people, there's museum attendance is up. Uh, library attendance is up. Book publishing is up. There's a whole new branch of literature that didn't exist before the internet called young adult literature, which many publishers say is actually sustaining publishing right now. Kids can't read enough. You know, all the, uh, um, do you remember, do you know Scholastic Magazine, the magazine that right. did, they did a study this summer because the cliche is with the internet, no one, kids don't read anymore. They don't read long books anymore. It turns out a 15 year old today reads more books in a year for pleasure than his parents read and more books than his parents read when the parents were 15. Isn't that fascinating? They, publishers can't, and some of the books, like the, I've just started reading the, the Hunger Games series for young adults. These are astonishing books that deal with complex, very complex subjects. 
<laughs> painful subjects, about realistic subjects about our world, and they're, they're designed for young people. All that is encouraging. And yes, I agree completely, how we turn that energy and that excitement into attendance in the classroom. And I think one reason it's hard is because students believe they will never get a job with a humanities degree. And that's one reason why Steve Jobs was great about talking about actually we need people with a larger background. And whenever I talk to businesses, I'm, there's some kind of interference going on. Whenever, whenever I talk to um, business, you're getting somebody from somebody the, needs to, on the a other power side of the line. <laughs> um, so whenever I talk to businesses, they say we actually want students who have the ability to think critically, to be analytical, to bring ideas together in a synthetic way, who have some kind of historical perspective and technological understanding. But that's not maybe a message that we've Actually, if I had to worry about anything, I'd worry about schools of business because, I, uh, I mean, over and over again, study after study say they're not teaching their students to read, to write, and to think critically. And according to a recent study, it's maybe one of the worst disciplines on a university campus these days. And, uh, uh, but I, Ryan, I spent a lot of time, uh, no surprise, visiting with alums and with, with donors trying to raise money for the university. And I hear the same over and over again. They're hungry. They're hungry for students who know how to read, write, and think. The ideal path for them might be get yourself a BA in history or English or in the arts, and then if you want to go into business, maybe do a one-year MBA and then start your, your career. And many of these people, we don't brag about this, but there have been studies that show that your prospects for success in the world of business may start a little slower if you're humanist, but your long-term prospects are actually Higher. greater. Yep. And, uh, and, and there are a lot of um, business people, you, you, you're raising money from some very wealthy people, and they're as interested in your life as a scholar or a writer or a historian or whatever as, as you might be interested in their life. They have, they, they read books like crazy, they're supporters of the arts, they love opera, they belong to the local, uh, society supporting the local orchestra. They're, they're deeply engaged in their own life. I was with Senator Alan Simpson the other day. He was here on our campus giving a, giving a talk on the budget crisis, but he also got into a long discussion about the flavor of politics these days. And it turns out that the guys had a deep abiding love of museums, orchestra, literature, and he referred to it as the soft edge of his life. And he described the rest of his life as just a constant sort of brutal combat in, in modern American politics and the, and the arts and the humanities as the soft edge that keeps him humanized and so on. So I, I think there's, we may not always be looking at the right spot, but there are a lot of people out there who understand and appreciate the importance of the humanities. But that's enough for us. Let's see what yes. they have to say. Now, I think you have to wait, as I understand it, until you have the mic, because all of this is being recorded, so. Yes. This is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and I very, found this all very interesting and thought-provoking. Um, Time Magazine recently had an article about the burden of student debt and, and had little vignettes about um, five sample students and how, what they're majoring in and how much debt they have and their fears of paying it back. And the following week, there were letters to the editor saying, every single person you interviewed is majoring in design and English and history and the arts and how come you didn't have any science, math, technology, engineering students? They're the ones that are going to get the jobs, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, and you're saying this is wonderful and you know more people need to major in the humanities and the arts and, and um, literature. And it seems like a contradiction. And I was just wondering if you could address that. Well, my reference to, you know, it used to be 40 years ago or 50 years ago, you might have had half of your students majoring in the arts and sciences, maybe a 30, 35% of them majoring in, in what we would recognize today as fine arts and uh, the humanities broadly uh, defined. Today, it's a much, much, much smaller population. Majors in business have exploded. It was about 30 years ago, you couldn't get a business school to offer an undergraduate major in business. Maybe a minor, that was it. They were all about the professional degree, the MBA. Now, 
now about a third of all students coming into higher education want to be business majors. And the offshoot of that is a decline in the number of students studying the humanities. And I, my reference there is that if we can't replenish ourselves, the humanities really will be in trouble. And I don't, I, I don't believe people when they say that you can't get a job in the real world with a humanities degree. Almost every student that I know of, every really bright student these days, and I bet you see this all the time at Duke as well, they, have, they, they get out of college with two majors. Right. So I think they'll find a practical degree if they want to, but I, that we would need to give them an opportunity to get that second major in the humanities. They'll be better off for it, and then they will get a job. I'm not worried about that. I mean, we make too much of a fuss today because it's hard for anybody to get a job. Right. You get a law degree, you're going to have trouble getting yourself a, a, a job. Even in engineering, the market is, is falling off to some extent. So it's not... It's, it's more a statement about the state of the economy these days than it is about the utility of getting a humanities degree. I, I complete, agree completely with um, what my colleague is saying, and I would add one, Philip. I also spend behind the scenes when I'm talking to professional humanists, not to a general audience like this, but to professional humanists. My other role is to be the grump, not to serve the optimistic person, but to say it is our responsibility as humanists to see and to help our students see how they can translate all the great things they learn in the humanities into usable skills for their future. So I do resume writing clinics where I have stu I, I always do them with faculty and students, and we actually do inventories of what they've learned and translate those into resume, into resume language. Um, I also do a lot of work in what's called digital. I'm not sure I love this term, digital humanities. I think that's a, actually a silly term because I think all humanities should be digital because we live in a digital world now. But um, so, for example, in my classes, the final exam is what I call a public contribution to knowledge. Um, I don't care about a research paper written for me. In this age, I want students to have a much higher standard than getting an A from me. They're Duke students. They know how to get an A from me. I want them to publish work on the internet in a way that makes sense and makes, you know, whether it's a Wikipedia entry that's a weak entry that they can bolster or even add to, sometimes writing them from scratch, or contributing to some kind of online forum, but actually doing something that will put their work out there to the highest professional standards to an audience. That ability, any employer wants, right? How you take a complex subject and can communicate it to other people who are not um, privy to that kind of expertise is a, an incredibly valuable job skill because that's how collaboration works within an organization. So I think you're completely right, right about two skills. A lot of my students major in uh, biomedical engineering, which is our toughest major probably at Duke. Duke created that field and we have a legacy of that being a very, very tough field at Duke. Um, biomedical engin engineering and English, uh, for example. And those students do not have trouble getting jobs but teaching humanists how to translate what they do on a professional level to the future of their students in the world, I think is very important. That's another, another kind of work that we need to be doing in the world. Could you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more, please, about that integration between the two fields? I mean, for millennia, there have been these discussions of uh, can you raise your hand if you're talking? We can't see who's talking. Oh, over here? Ah. Got it? <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, about the integration of these two fields. For millennia, scholars have written about this. Well, you know, there's this practical aspect, and then the, uh, the first question indeed was very good about all these people, and you're saying there aren't enough science and math and engineering majors and so on, but that there should be but we still need this integration, and I don't see it in any meaningful fashion in any way. Could you come up with a program, perhaps? Sure. Um, we know the Humanities uh, Institute at Duke that um, I was privileged to be one of the co-founders of um, under its new director has gone, uh, has taken on a direct direction, we call them Humanities Labs. Uh, and so, for example, this year there's a lab on Haiti. And um, if you just read, I think it was this week even, in the New York Times, an article that appeared in Science Magazine that was produced by the faculty and students together in the Haiti lab was able to pinpoint the fact that cholera um, had never been present in Haiti before by looking at everything going back to 19th century slave records and then post-revolutionary ship records um, in Haiti and then 
put that together with people from Global Health who were also wor working in the Haiti lab together and actually came up with a position paper based on history as well as on science for IDC and recommendations for what the um, IDC could do for, is IDC, is that right? It's the Center for Disease Control, International Center for Disease Control. I think I got the acronyms wrong. Uh, say it again. CDC, thank you so much. <laughs> the CDC to actually have a game plan going forward for dealing with this cholera outbreak um, that happened in Haiti. Now, that was a very you know, bold and great win-win for this way of thinking, but we also have a, a learning games lab, and we have another land, uh, lab called Borderworks, which is working on um, migration of peoples and uh, refugees and forced migrations. And again, it's humanist social scientists and scientists as well as technology people, because everything is done publicly, working together. That's a phenomenal education for students, no matter what their major is, um, to be able to put those things together and help to understand a complex world a little better. And we've not had problems with the students getting jobs. So been, this is our third year now, graduating from the labs. Revisiting the decline of students entering the humanities, who do you think is driving it? The parents who are paying the bills or the students? And would your response be different depending on what is the cause? Well, I, I do think that uh, particularly in this kind of an economy, you're going to find parents and students worried about are they going to be marketable. And there's, there's, there's no doubt that that kind of pressure uh, drives some students away from the humanities. I also think, you know, we can't let our ourselves off the hook entirely. Um, you know, we're, we're not always as, best, uh, as good as we could be at putting our best teaching talent in freshman courses and in the general education curriculum courses where you go fishing for majors, right. basically. Right. Uh, we've pushed a lot of our best talent out of the undergraduate classroom altogether into graduate programs that are often, these days, uh, oversized and bloated, producing PhDs who can't find a market for their own services. So we need to, and I think this is a national issue these days, we need to re-engage ourselves. I mean, the modern university that we're living in today is basically a post-World War II experience, but places like the University of Illinois and uh, the first half of the 20th century, we weren't the great research institutions they've become since then. We've grafted all this research apparatus and scholarship apparatus, labs and libraries on top of what used to be predominantly a, an undergraduate teaching institution. I'm all for that, by the way. I'm very proud of the fact that we, uh, we do a, you know, a, nearly a billion dollars worth of sponsored research at the University of Illinois. But on the, in the process, the uh, salaries, the, the reward and award structure, everything began to shift towards research and graduate education. And I think that's all fine, but at the expense of the undergraduate program, I don't think that's very good at all. So I think we need, uh, we need to reinvest, I think. And, and we, you know, really, that's our biggest weapon when you think about it, because it's pretty much the arts and sciences, and I would include in there, uh, the humanities, of course, have an ownership of a good chunk of the general education curriculum. And so we need to, to start thinking about how we reshape that curriculum to address kind of the issues that Kathy was talking about and, and move, move the instruction in the humanities, not just research, but instruction in the humanities in some of these new directions, including more interdisciplinary directions. And I would say as humanities faculty, or faculty in the humanities broadly defined, uh, we, we had a little bit of a disadvantage, you know. If, you're, uh, if you happen to be a dean of a business school, any pre-professional school, let alone professional school, you have outside accrediting agencies. If you're in engineering, you have an outside accrediting agency. Or business, you have an outside accrediting agency. Uh, business accrediting agency is dominated by business deans. When they come and give an accreditation, they're thinking of the future of business, <laughs> and they, they are, they, 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 the business schools can leverage that accreditation process uh, to earn resources in order to preserve and protect their accreditation. Same with engineering. No such accrediting agency that I know really exists for the humanities. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, maybe we ought to form one and, uh, and, and make a good living going around telling universities uh, how they need to invest in the humanities or they're going to lose their accreditation and so on. But we, we should take advantage of the fact that students do spend probably half of their whole undergraduate experience in the general education curriculum, you know, and we, we should look at that curriculum and try to shape it in ways that prepares the next generation of humanists and also invest in our first two years of teaching on the humanities side with our very best talent so that students can right away be exposed to the excitement of the humanities. In the end, I believe students will want to do what they want to do. Uh, they, they, they may not find the history major, it will get them a job, well they'll worry about that in some other way. They'll, they'll fill in with the second major, they'll get a minor in accounting or something like that. But in the end, all of us drifted to uh, the discipline that excited us. And, uh, and I think we need to reinvest, uh, we need to reinvest undergraduate education, particularly at public universities with more of that kind of excitement. Interestingly, when um, Chinese students were interviewed, actually at the University of Illinois, which has a very large percentage of students coming from China, they were not nearly as interested in studying science and math as they were in figuring out how Americans thought and interested in critical and analytical thinking and understanding more about the innovative spirit of Americans. So they were really here to learn that one of the things that they put very high on the survey list, um, I heard a talk about this um, in Hawaii last year from your provost, I believe, at uh, University of Illinois. I'm, I'm forgetting who this was. Ned, yes, that's who it was, exactly. Yes, and, um, and this ability to think about, um, to think critically and creatively was what the students who were coming to, from, to the US from other countries were most admiring of. Uh, at the University of Illinois. That's fascinating to me. Also, I think every survey of, of people who are successful say their expertise is less important than their passion. So mm -hmm. what you said about how students follow their passion and then how they need to supplement in other skills, I think it's so important. And that is, a, passion is the great motivator of working too long, working too hard, and enjoying doing it in the process. Mm -hmm. Who is Hi. it that said if you if you love your work you'll never work to you'll never have to work? So, I, that's a very bad paraphrase. Very bad. <laughs> hi, uh, up here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a Chicago public school high school teacher, and I've uh, been teaching one of the few humanities courses that's offered in the city. Uh, my question for you is: We seem to, as a society, be adopting this whole love of standardization, standardized testing, <laughs> and it's really stifling the humanities. Um, I see it in my school. I see it all across the city. <laughs> I wonder if that adds to why so many students going into college don't even consider it when it's not offered at the elementary or even offered at the high school level because you know we're too busy practicing test taking skills. Well, I'll just start off. Uh, I don't. This, if you happen to be a historian, you've known for years that it's one of the worst taught subjects in public schools. And it certainly was in my case. It's amazing to me that I came through K through 12 with any interest in becoming a history major. Actually, I was an English major, and then I became later a double major in history, so it was like a double whammy. <laughs> but, uh, and I still think that's true. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't think it was the, the, the public schools do enough to uh, invest their own curriculum with good instruction, good instruction in the humanities. Literature, maybe. History, more problematic, I would say. And uh, as far as the arts and things like that are concerned, I mean, they're often the very first pieces of a, a public school curriculum that gets cut out in, the, in, 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 a, in, in, in a budget crisis and so on. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do about that, but I, 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 I just want to say I echo uh, and share your concern and your complaint about it. If I can just add to that, I am positive within the next five years we're going to rethink uh, our national policy, No Child Left Behind, national policy for end of grade testing. I don't think there's a student, a parent, a teacher, a principal, a school board um, that really believes that we're doing a very good job with those end of grade tests. The best testing is always, I, I'm a huge proponent of testing, but uh, the best testing is always adaptive, where you're testing in the moment in a way that inspires students to then learn, to have a test that happens 
multiple choice test at the end of the uh, of schooling does, at school year doesn't, just simply doesn't work. Uh, Americans test earlier and more often than any other nation on the planet. Um, it's also very recent. My, in writing, now you see it, my editor said, you keep whining about end of grade testing. Who invented the multiple choice test? Never occurred to me there was a person. <laughs> and there was. 1914, men Probably are at a humanist. war. Probably <laughs> a humanist, right. <laughs> men are at war, women are in the factories. Um, hundreds of thousands of immigrants are coming to America. America's just passed a new legislation saying that um, you need two years of compulsory high school. Before, high school, before that high school was only for people going on to college. There was a teacher shortage, a terrible teacher shortage, and a young PhD student at Kansas State Teachers College, now I think it's called Emporia State, uh, Frederick Kelly, 1914, says, hey, I've got an idea to solve this crisis, and I can get my dissertation written too. I can, um, uh, Henry, Henry Ford is, is creating Model T's on an assembly line. What's the Model T equivalent for education? He said, how about this multiple choice test, and he invents the multiple choice test, which he calls, and this is a phrase I would never use, but I'm talking about 1914, a, low, a test of lower order thinking for the lower orders. <laughs> the war ends, he renounces the test. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. everybody else takes it up as a great idea for efficiency. It's an efficient way of getting people through the testing system. It's an incredible story. He goes on to be head of the University of Idaho on a very Dewey-esque thinking is doing, integrated collect curriculum, science is humanities, humanities is science, all of that. And he's fired in two years because they thought they were hiring the father of scientific testing, which by that time is what the scholastic aptitude test for college entrance is based on. So it's a, I think learn, this is where humanities are important. I think before we can change those tests, it's important for all of us to go back and realize how provisional those tests are and how much we've built on those tests and now made as our national policy that I think it's time to rethink and rethink because it's not working. We have the data. The data from the test shows those tests don't work. Um, it doesn't work on the highest end. It doesn't work on the lowest end. Basically only works for a very middle group of students. It's contrib contributing to a higher dropout rate it's also contributing to the fact that 26% of students entering elite universities now have either been tested for, diagnosed as, or are taking performance enhancing drugs for learning disabilities. Now, if 26% of your top 1% of your students feel at some point they have, their parents feel they have to take them in to see if they have learning disabilities, there's a mismatch between how they're learning and the system in which they're learning. We, we, we will fix it, many of us. And I think probably everybody in this audience knows it's a system that needs fixing. We will fix it. But I'm sorry you have to put up with it for now, and thank you for your effort, because uh, you are a hero. You're a hero. Um, I feel very fortunate that I have a higher education experience at U of I. In fact, my graduate advisor was Jim Stuckel, who was a president uh -huh. for many years, an engineer. Uh, but we recently saw uh, the documentary Waiting for Superman, mm -hmm. which you may be familiar with, I would think you are, and I'm really enjoying this session, but what, how do you feel about the combination of the application of technology and the humanities uh, down level, where we have 40% of the people that don't finish high school, and at that academic level, the application of technology and the integration of humanities uh, to making a difference for uh, society. You want to start? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I'm very honored to be part of the MacArthur Foundation's huge initiative on digital media and learning, which especially targets those kids. And we've been able to find, if you have, have you been to U Media at Chicago Public Library? It's incredible. I gave a reading there and walked into U Media beforehand. It's that you walk into the front part of the library and there's all this technology and books all together and it's filled all the time with many of the kids are kids who've dropped out of school. And some of the kids, the head of the library, uh, the person who was taking me, the head of the speaker series at the library said to me, not only are the kids coming, they're bringing their parents who've never been to a library before. It's incredible, the, it's like a honeycomb that's attracting kids um, and the th um, uh, one thing we're finding is there's Kids who have been totally disaffected and outside the system. 
um, do really well with some kinds of technology enhanced um, tools like gaming. Uh, we've been working on an algebra program. A number of us have been working on an algebra pro program basically for kids who failed math. And the success rate's about 70, it's been tried at several sub public schools. Success rate's about 75%. And it's a fun program. And it starts at the very, very beginning. What is a number? Uh, and if you get that right, it then gives you another test. And you, it gets that, you get that right, it gives you another test. And if you get that right, by me, I mean a question. If you, get that, if you get it wrong, it gives you an easier one. And then the teacher's role is still hugely important. This does not replace teachers. What it means is the teacher can work with the good kids who are doing a great job, and they can see from this test that gives them instantaneous results who's doing a bad job and work with those kids. It's a, and the kids love it because it's fun, and they compete, and they get leaderboards, and they, when they get a high score, it goes, you know, everybody can see it in the classroom. <laughs> uh, it's also cheap because it, I've seen it done in schools where there literally is one laptop that the kids are all working on. It's a kind of an exciting thing. I don't think it replaces education, but it's a nice motivator for kids who have been so disincentivized that they can't even concentrate anymore. Motivation, we know, is the single most important thing for any kind of learning, whether it's humanities or the sciences. Um, I actually have, uh, my, my thing is twofold. <clears throat> the first one is, I started off uh, college in a private college, and then I kind of sort of, well, I wound up in a public college, a junior college, but I had one professor um, that made us read Crime and Punishment, and I will never forget this for as long as I live. <laughs> I know about Dos Kalioski. Um When he gave us the test, it was not a multiple test. It was not fill in the blank. He said, I want you to write everything you know about this book. Wow. And that, for me, that was heaven because I, wrote, I knew the book. I mean, I, I, I sat there and, 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 and read it. The thing was, I couldn't pronounce the names, and Lord knows I couldn't spell them. <laughs> so what I did is I renamed all the characters in the book, and I gave him what I knew about the test, or what I knew about the book. I got an A- minus for that because as a freshman, mm. you think some of the things that they give you to do is awful, but... The meaning behind that book will follow you all your life. If right. you read it again, like I've read it three times, and reading it again over and over, it changes. So as a freshman, I think that freshmen should have a mandatory um, focus with humanities. As a high school teacher, or a retired high school teacher, um, we did literature. And the things that were on the curriculum, because I took uh, over somebody's class, um, they were like, we don't want to do this. So I was like, okay, what do you want to do? So again, you in the iPod. It was a young man, he came in, he had an iPod. I said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna revamp this totally. We took the music off of his iPod, took the music out, and just dealt with the lyrics to find out where this person was and what they were thinking and how they felt as to why they wrote this music. Then I went all the way back to the 60s and the early, the early 70s, and I bought in Jimi Hendrix. And for them, they were like, this is like totally out of sorts. But again, I had all the lyrics written down, and they had to tell me what the, the composer was thinking, and they also had to tell me what they gained from it. So I, they, they love humanity. Children love humanities. They just don't know it. But you, some of the yeah, times you just exactly. have to bring them something that they can relate to. Because Lord knows, I, I couldn't relate to Dostoevsky when I was when I was 20, 18, 19 years old. <laughs> but now I understand it. So I, I thank you. I thank you. Last night I saw um, Xbox where they have a new kinetic where the lady is playing the guitar, but the I mean the lady is playing the um, the oboe, but the oboe's not there. But when she looks at the television, she could see whether or not she's hitting all the right chords. Oh, wow. So they've, Xbox has in, integrated their system now to work with the humanities. Well, I think that's a great, uh, I think that's a great, it's a great story, and it's sort of a very practical illustration of how uh, you can combine um, 
technology and the humanities are used technology in different ways to help uh, teach a love of literature, for example. And so I congratulate you on being so uh, innovative. And I also, uh, you know, I, I had the same experience in college reading uh, 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 Dostoevsky. So the brothers carved myself. I'm one of the great novels of all, of all times. It's so big, and to read it three times, that's a whole year of your life right there <laughs> <laughs> out the door. But I, I commend the way you read it and then the way you uh, extracted meaning from it. So I think that's just a terrific story. Yeah, Thanks for great. sharing it. I loved what you said about um, uh, you're, you're positive towards the world, but not naive. And I want to ask you, on, as far as the not naive side of it, where, where you think uh, perhaps the, the greatest threat to the humanities comes from, mm. the, the negative side? Well. Oh my gosh, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> um, I think right now our tax base is about the same as it was in, I think this is true, in about 1958, when only about 11% of people went on to college, and now I think it's about 23% of the population's in college. That's not sustainable. So I think we face a huge crisis if we don't deal with this whole problem of allocation of resources versus, versus our future. Um, we deal with a really huge crisis right now. Uh, in terms of that. I think the, the increasing gap between rich and poor in this country doesn't sustain a middle class. And education is about an a middle class, right? If you believe in education, you believe in the importance of the middle class, right? Because rich people are going to get educated one way or another, and poor people aren't unless we help them. It's about raising, I mean, the whole point of education is to try to raise as many people into a middle class as possible, as long as we have a very bifurcated um, and disparate uh, uh, distribution of resources, that's going to get bad, not only for the humanities, but for all education. I think the way it has a particular impact on the humanities is the humanities deals with social and political issues. And as we know, it's very hard in this country to get any kind of um, consensus about social and political issues. It deals with messy issues that are often uncomfortable and often with outliers um, who are either innovators or outcasts. Um, and who maybe don't lead conventional lifestyles because that's why we read Crime and Punishment. It's, just, it's not because it's people like us, but it's because it introduces to people who might not be like us so we can understand how people who are different from us think. That's the brilliance of Dostoevsky. And I think of Jimi Hendrix too. I mean, that is the brilliance. But, but giving funding to something that privileges the outlier and the and difference is not necessarily a political expedient these days. So we've got a lot of really difficult, complex issues to deal with, and a lot of threats to the middle class way of life, the educated way of life, and the humanistic way of life. And I think those are um, braided in extremely complex ways that right now that mean we have to be optimistic but not naive if we're going to solve this. And we have to solve it as a community. That you came out on a beautiful Saturday in the midst of a marathon that was snarling all your traffic to me is a very hopeful and optimistic I, sign. I, I think if I can just take a short stab at it, and it'll be pretty uh, short, and it, it starts with the remarks that Kathy made in her opening presentation about why the founders uh, were, were so, uh, uh, so interested in uh, pushing public education. And it's one of, really one of the great human success stories. Uh, and, but, but they weren't the only ones. Uh, I mean, if you look at, the, uh, at all of American history and the role of higher, it's the single greatest democratizing force in, the, in, in, in America, in American life, and always has been. And not just because the founders saw it as essential to creating a, a skilled, but also um, a, 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 not just skilled workforce, but skilled citizens. Uh, time and time again, we've come back to that notion and invested heavily in education. And, and, and uh, I mean, just look at the post-World War II experience. You know, up until then, as you were saying, very few people went to college. It was something for the gentry, really. But as we left the Second World War and we were in the new science age and uh, the states and the federal government began to invest heavily in education, and they opened it up to the middle class, which is now shrinking and disappearing. And 
They opened it up so we saw wave after wave, you know, through the GI Bill, regular people, not uh, upper class people, regular middle class people, and, and even lower entering the higher education workforce and exploding. Uh, higher education exploded. Then came women, then came people of color. In all of these ways, higher education has been a, a powerful democratizing force in American life and really also one of the keys to a, a, a happiness and a vibrant economy. So I see the real threat to the humanities less uh, from uh, a decline of vibrancy in the fields represented by the humanities. They were just as vibrant as ever. And I, I see the threat, not just in this growing disparity of incomes, um, but in just a, the, the, the meat axe approach to reducing public support sure. for higher education. A state like the University of Illinois, uh, you know, 40 years ago got half or more of its budget from the state. Today it's, it's operating, but today it's down to 15%. So in, in one, one result of that is we begin to price middle class students out of a, other opportunities for a higher education. So we become more and more like Duke and other universities. We charge a high sticker price for those who can afford it and we take the revenue and redistribute it to those who can't afford it in the form of scholarships or tuition rebates. In effect, doing uh, for our students and their families what the state used to do. And, uh, but it, that's not a sustainable model either. Uh, so I think that's the big, single, greatest, long-term threat to the humanities and, and, and as one part of, uh, of, uh, of a university curriculum, basically. That's from top to bottom under complete siege these days. I think that's a oh. great place to end. On a high note. No, it is a high note. Vote and, and uh, support education. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for Thanks, coming. Thank you. Thank you.